Welcome back. Here we go. Phylum Echinodermata. Echinodermata. So we, derm, you've probably heard of that root word before, right? Like a dermatologist. So it means skin. And echino, echino means spiny. So these are known for having spiny skin because they have uh, some calcified layer to their, uh, to their skin that makes them spiny or hard. So one thing that's different about this group compared to the other invertebrates that we've seen is that they are in subphylum deuterostomia. All right, so if we remember what that means, deuterostomia, deutero means second and stome means mouth. So that means that in their developmental stages, when they go through gastrulation, the infolding of that tissue in the embryonic stage, that first pore that forms, that blastopore, that's going to become the anus and their mouth develops later. Their mouth is gonna form at the other end of the embryo, right? So they're deuterostomes. So the phylum that are deuterostomes are gonna be phylum echinodermata and then chordata, which we'll talk about later. So subphylum deuterostomia, phylum echinodermata. These are the uh, things like sea stars, urchins, sand dollars, brittle stars, sea cucumbers. Those are all part of this phylum echinodermata. But hold up a minute, right? This is part of bilateria, the clade bilateria, but these don't look bilateral. Well, the kicker is they're bilateral in their larval stages, okay? So when their larvae are free swimming, they're floating around through the oceans, they're bilateral, and then when they settle and they transition to their adult stage, they become what we call pentaradial symmetri symmetrical. So they have, a five, they have five lines of symmetry usually. So these are triploblastic, they are coelomates, they do not have a centralized nervous system like we think of in um, a lot of even in arthropods or in chordates. They have a ring of nerves that's in their central disc. And that ring of nerves extends out through each of their arms if they, if they have arms or throughout the rest of their test, their shell. And that central nervous system is going to coordinate the movements of their water vascular system. And their water vascular system is how they power their two feet, what they used to crawl around with. So they are able to bring water into their bodies and then they use water pressure in order to coordinate their movements. And they use muscles that are controlled by their nervous system to coordinate those movements, that pressure of that water vascular system. So class Asteroidae, so these are the true sea starts. So most of these are gonna be found in marine environments. There are some that can exist in brackish environments, but they're found anywhere from intertidal zones to abyssal depths. So literally living on the bottom of the oceans on the deepest parts that we know of. They are usually going to have a central disc with five, sometimes more arms, though some of them can have up to 20 arms um, coming out of that central disc. And so on this aboral side, this is where they have a structure called a madreporite that they use to bring water in to their water vascular system. And then on the other side underneath that central disc is where we would find their mouth. And so what they're gonna do, they're gonna use their two feet. They're gonna use that, that water vascular system to, and muscles to contract and, and coordinate their two feet. And then they're going to crawl over whatever food they want to eat, and basically place themselves on top of that food and use their two feet to open up that marine invertebrate that they're going to eat. So it's usually, a lot of times it's things that are not mobile, so, um, or are fairly slow like they are. So think about like this sea star moving on top of a mussel or a clam and then using its two feet to wrench open that muscle or that clam to open up its shell. And then they extend, a lot of them will um, extend their stomach down into whatever they're going to eat with digestive juices and then they bring it all back up in and then they digest it and break it down for energy. So this group has a really cool ability where they can regenerate their limbs so if one of is this if this sea star was to lose one of these limbs or maybe two of them, it can regrow those limbs, which is pretty cool. They also can go through um, asexual re reproduction in kind of a similar manner. If they split their central disc, okay, so if we were to cut that sea star in half down that central disc, 
both sides could regrow into a brand new organism. So it's a form of asexual reproduction. They also have sexual reproduction. They tend to have separate male and female um, sexes in this group, and then they send their gametes out into the ocean. So they don't get together. There's no internal fertilization. It's external fertilization. Um, they're also known for having an endoskeleton. So they have um, ossified ridges inside of here that provides them some structure to their arms as well. All right, so class of Phyroidea, these are the brittle and basket stars. So they're different in the sense that morphologically their limbs, their arms tend to be a lot thinner, a lot narrower than we see in the classic sea stars. So these include both the brittle and basket stars. So in basket stars, they have um, highly adapted limbs that create kind of this um, structure where it's kind of like woven, almost looks woven like a basket that they can use to stick out and filter feed. Members of this group are commonly found below 6,000 meters. They are known to live on the bottoms of the ocean in the benthic, in the benthic ranges, but they're also pretty common members of, of coral reef communities. So again, they're pretty widespread. They tend to take on roles of detritivores, eating dead organic material, scavengers, filter feeders, or sometimes even predators. So they have a really wide lifestyle. And so we are going to switch over and so here's an example. I know this is kind of a low quality um, video, but it's an example of what they look like when they're moving. That's pretty cool. They're pretty fast considering they're using all those little tiny tube feet. The next class, class Echinoidea, these are the sea urchins and sand dollars. Um, so urchins are typically going to be grazing on algae. So they're still technically pentaradial. So if we think of the body plan of a sea star, take those legs and fold them up to create a circle. And then the central disc is going to be at the bottom and the legs have been folded up around. That's how we get the sea star. Or excuse me, that's how we go from sea star into the um, urchins. And then we take that that circular form and we flatten it a little bit and that's how we get the sand dollars. Also sometimes called sand biscuits. So the urchins, again, they're typically grazing on algae. They are known off the coast of California for eating a lot of kelp as well. And the sand dollars, they're typically going to be feeding on uh, larvae, diatoms, copepods, they're filter feeders, detritus, and what they tend to do is they tend to bury themselves into soft sand, they tend to live in groups, and then they use um, the extensions of their two feet, they kind of wave in the water and they're going to catch up, catch whatever food they can. Here's an urchin. So we can see all of its two feet waving around. Okay, and this is actually an urchin that's released, it's a male urchin that's releasing gametes. So they're going to release their gametes, all this cloudy stuff, that's all its gametes that, are, that it's releasing. And we can see it's two feet. It's two feet are extending out through its entire body. So what the urchins are going to do, they're going to use those two feet to move around, and then use those two feet to kind of funnel food into their mouth, which is on the underside of them. And they have a unique feeding structure called an Aristotle's lantern that they use to eat food. And then this is the underside of a sand dollar. You can see it's two feet moving. It's giving it kind of that waving look. So those are all of its two feet moving. And so what it's going to be doing, it's going to be using these two feet to grab onto stuff and then using a, a chain of these two feet to move the food to the center of the organism right here. And then class Holothoroidea, these are the sea cucumbers. So again, they're still pentaradially symmetrical, even though they look like they're bilaterally symmetrical, they have an internal pentaradial symmetry. And we take that, that five-pointed sea star, we're going to take its limbs, we're going to fold it up, and now we're going to extend it out. So its, um, it's mouth is going to be on one end, its anus is going to be on the other end. Um, and that's how we get the sea cucumber body shape. So these typically have a pretty reduced endoskeleton um, if some of them have lost it altogether. 
and they're usually scavengers. They're using some of those tube feet to around their mouth to bring their food into their body. And then they're using contractions of their water of their water vascular, the hydrovascular system to move around. They have a commens some of them even have commensalistic relationships um, with other organisms. So what that means is commensalism, one organism benefits, the other organism is neutral, it's not affected by any means. Um, that tend to live in or around their mouth or cloaca. And so, um, <laughs> especially um, things like pearlfish um, or some shrimp will live inside of the cloaca of the sea cucumber and eat some of its uh, feces as it comes out because it's not completely digested so it can get food and a safe place to live but the sea, the sea cucumber isn't harmed at all.